Hello everyone and welcome back to Solar System Tourism and Kerbal Space Program 1.8.1 with Realism Overhaul, where I send my Twitch livestream audience to their preferred destination, providing that they pay with the in-stream currency struts, which they earn by watching. We begin with our Kerbals around Jupiter, Pekka, Synonym, Toast Crunch, and Envy Silence, and their return to Earth. Uh, this is just another correction burn, and they will have a long trip to go before they actually reach home, but they should be in good shape. Uh, you can see the Earth periapsis shaping up there, and we'll probably have to do some more corrections with them. But for now, we turn to Mars, and this is around Phobos, and we have uh, that return vehicle, the Hyde, uh, trying to bring a few Kerbals back. I check it out, and then separate it from the Phobos station. We have Copper Spikes, Durlaf, and the Siski returning. Durlaf and the Siski have been around Mars for quite a long time. I think they might have been among the first crew that we sent to Mars. Uh, if I recall, maybe the very first crew. So anyway, that is it backing off very tenuously. It has very little maneuverability, uh, this thing. And of course, it's got ion engines to return it home. So those are going to take some time. I like this shot where it's sort of sandwiched between Mars and Phobos there. But uh, yeah, you can see it turning very slowly. And while I plot the maneuver for the trip back home, uh, don't believe the Delta V requirements. It's going to take much more than that. We're going to have to do many orbits around Mars to get that done. But for now, we need to turn to other things because we need to resupply Skylab 2 before this can return home. And that is this launch on the Kasei rocket with four CG2 boosters. So, it's just for buffer. We could probably have done that maneuver before Skylab would have run out of supplies, but I decided to take care of this first. So, here we go. And launching from Cape Canaveral, of course, and there go the four boosters. Unfortunately, uh, I did not save Separatrons with the craft, uh, with the subassembly, sorry, not the craft file. And because I didn't put Separatrons on the first stage, the first stage knocked out the second stage engine. And this happens in real life too. It has happened with uh, real life rockets. Uh, you need to make sure to put proper Separatrons on your first stage. And so I did, and we launched again. So, yep, these things happen. And boosters go off. And this time, of course, when the first stage runs out, it will safely separate. It is an extraordinarily large engine on the first stage, and that's because it's the vacuum variant of one of the first stage engines. Not necessarily the optimal thing uh, for most applications, but it cer certainly helps it carry a whole lot to lower orbit. Not really what you normally look for in a hydrogen-oxygen rocket, but anyway, when I designed it, I wasn't really thinking about that. So that stage deorbits itself, it had some to spare, but this just needs to get to Skylab 2, which is in low Earth orbit, so it doesn't really need anything more. It's got four of the Gemini lander engines, uh, the cute little stubby engines that each provide about 11 kilonewtons, and it gets over to the station. Skylab 2 is exactly like Sky Skylab, including the busted solar array. That was not intentional, that just sort of happened. And here it comes into dock, a fairly large supply container. And hopefully we won't have to pay attention to Skylab for a very long time. And there we go. All right, so that leaves us free to turn back to the hide, which is doing its ion engine burn in order to return home to Earth as plotted. But again, it takes some time with these ion engines, and certainly more than one orbit around Mars, so you can see our orbit expanding, and we start to burn way ahead of the maneuver node, so it's not very accurate, so we need to use quite a lot of our available Delta V, and that brings up the question of capturing once we get down to actually reaching Earth SOI, and that has me worried, of course. One would be worried, but there the orbit finally expands really far out and we have one more orbit to go there and now it breaks. Of course there's a point where it will go on escape and we cannot continue doing burns around Mars. So there it is on escape. And the correction to really fix it up because it was deviating quite a lot from the desired maneuver 
uh, was about another 2,000 meters per second, and so we're doing that here. Still, I think it's it's enough delta V in the end, and we do manage to, with uh, another correction, get it its Earth encounter, and it'll be arriving during this episode, as a matter of fact, because it doesn't take too long to get back to Mars compared to all the other things that we're doing, like Jupiter and Saturn. Speaking of Saturn, uh, here are our Saturn Kerbals, uh, including Ballard Root, Mr. Doobie, Arthur E. King, and Katak, and they are of course also trying to make their way back home. And in this huge ship with the spinning section from USI. And that's gonna take a while. That's a long trip to get back to Earth from Saturn. And fortunately we do have an encounter right away. And they still have a fair amount of Delta V. In fact, they'll have more Delta V as they consume the food, water, and oxygen, and the whole ship gets lighter because they do. But yeah, they have something like seven years of supplies. Well, the water probably recycles a little bit, so more than that. All right, so they're on their way back, and we go to this ship, which is capturing around Jupiter. It's sort of a station with a lot of supplies. It was launched on the Monument Launcher, probably because I just wanted to do a Monument Launcher launch, not that we actually had to do this, but probably somebody mentioned the Monu Monument Launcher during the stream, and I decided that it'd be fun to launch it, and I needed something sufficiently large to launch on it, and this was it. So, in order to get this over to Jupiter, because it's more than 400 tons, we needed the Monument Launcher. So here it is, capturing around Jupiter with nine ion engines. Not that that's easy, because it's so heavy. Even nine... it's not really nine ion engines, it's actually 90. Each of those nine blocks has ten of them. So, it's a lot of ion engines, but still, because it's so heavy, it's not easy to do the capture. Fortunately, Jupiter itself helps and we manage it without too much trouble. Here's a Jupiter supply vessel, which is sort of eclipsed by the big Jupiter bonus monument launch that we just saw. I don't know if we really need these extra supplies, especially since our Jupiter Kerbals are coming back home already. But we'll be ready to go for the next batch of Kerbals who want to come over to Jupiter. And here it is capturing, again, ion engines. Ion engines, not great for a lot of things, but when it comes to capturing cargo around other planets, it's not so bad. Cargo missions and ion engines definitely go together. Since the sandbox mode though, I don't have to worry about the cost of propellants, and of course the availability of xenon gas or argon gas and all this stuff and the cost of them are pretty high, so the availability is pretty low. And so, if NASA was trying to do this stuff, it'd be a little bit more complicated. So there's a correction for our crew returning back home with the hide, and in fact the hide gets into Earth SOI. It's already there. We were able to time warp through a whole bunch of stuff because we had everything resupplied already. And here, even though it doesn't look like it, the ion engines are on. You can see the throttle up and the Delta V melting away, and they are capturing that we can use the ion engines during time warp, it's just that the ion engine effect does not appear during time warp, only out of time warp. I decided to light the nuclear engine because we actually had some hydrogen left somehow, so the tank insulation was pretty good this time, and we managed to capture. So, they are, well they're not quite back home, we have to bring them down and we will do that during this episode, but they have captured around Earth at least, so they are safe-ish. And uh, to actually name another viewer, actually, we have a viewer called Safish. But next we go to the complete other end of the solar system as Pollux is arriving at Pluto. So Pollux wanted to be ejected out of the solar system and I decided it would be best if, if he just flew by Pluto and Sharon slash Karen. I prefer calling it Sharon. Uh, that's just how I pronounce it, but I know it's probably not right. But anyway, here we go, flying by Pluto and its most prominent companion, if you will. Now Pollux had a fair bit of room on this trip and obviously enough supplies to get him this far, but eventually those supplies are gonna run out and we're gonna have to figure out what to do with that. I do not intend to let Pollux perish, but 
we are going to have to really make use of some stuff from KSB Interstellar to catch up to Pollux as he passes the orbit of Pluto and goes out into the further reaches of the solar system. I don't know if this, this counts as being ejected out of the solar system yet. Passing Pluto, obviously, uh, every few years they tell us that Voyager has exited the solar system or something like that. There's always different boundaries for what actually constitutes the edge of the solar system. So I don't know where that is in Kerbal Space Program, but probably we're not there yet as far as Pluto is concerned. Just passing Pluto is not enough. This is our Lunar Gateway, which we now need to resupply, having time warped through quite a few things. And so I decided that the best berthing location is where that hydrogen nuclear stage, the NTR stage, is right now. And I wanted a Kerbal to blow that up because it didn't have the propellant necessary to deorbit itself. So it's a little bit dodgy to have a Kerbal being so close to a nuclear thermal rocket engine. But I assume it's cooled down by now. It's been docked at a station for months and months, maybe years. So maybe it's all right. So the Kerbal just dismantles all that stuff. And the tank, of course. And that tank on top. And then we will have our docking port free. We have to get that docking port off too. So yeah, we have a free docking port where we can send supplies to the Lunar Gateway. Yep, a little bit awkward, but we've got all sorts of different RCS systems on this, and it turns out that we didn't have the RCS fuel for that thing, so that it could deorbit itself. Alright, so we are launching supplies to Luna Gateway, and again, Kasei rocket with four Sajita boosters. At this point, I mainly went with the Kasei rocket because, first of all, I designed it, and second of all, uh, the time spent on picking a launch system uh, was getting a little bit much, so we're just going to stick to the basics here. Also allowed me to remove some launch systems from the install so that we don't have to keep all that stuff in. That also made room for other mods that I might want to throw in there, especially ones that I've made. Of course, now I've upgraded to 64 gigabytes since this uh, particular stream. At this point, it was still just 32 gigabytes of RAM. And so now I could probably throw whatever mod I want into the install without any problems. But uh, at the time, I was a little bit more limited. When trying to run this install, it would take like all the RAM. It was, uh, it was daunting. Uh, this one is definitely stuffed. Lots of different systems to test and try out, all sorts of parts, the USI parts, the KSB Interstellar parts, these are all huge mods. Anyway, our little supply vessel with uh, AG-10 190s, I believe, is arriving at the Lunar Gateway to dock at the port that we just freed. And we were actually carrying some liquid hydrogen along with the regular supplies in order to fill up the pair which is docked opposite the supply vessel right there. The pair has an NTR using liquid hydrogen. Unfortunately, I think all the liquid hydrogen boiled off before we actually got to use the pair. So that's how that went. But that's why the supply vessel had those big radiators. Anyway, uh, this is a launch to get the crew off of the hide vessel that brought uh, three crew members back from Mars and so we followed that trip the whole way during this video already and yeah just trying to get it to orbit that's a extended Sajita rocket with uh, two boosters the Sajita heavy version and then we have the upper stage and the launch escape system separation this is the pass-through version of the Lynx spacecraft which I designed and so the Kerbals are going to have to scramble in there and sit in their own command chairs. And here I am trying to get the rendezvous and this upper stage with its methane oxygen engine doing the rendezvous. Well, one of the rendezvous burns. And then another rendezvous burn because we have to get to a fairly high orbit here. But there ends up being a problem here because I put the second stage on the wrong node or however you want to call it, but the problem is the second stage is permanently attached to the engine of the service module of the Lynx capsule, and so we ended up feeding the service module propellant into the second stage, 
because it's directly connected right now. And using the second stage to continue with the rendezvous, I didn't really want to do that. But since we're stuck, we're stuck. And so it's doing the rendezvous burn despite its really high thrust weight ratio. And a Kerbal goes out and we have more destruction. The Kerbal actually goes out and destroys the second stage. And there we go. Now the service module engine on the Lynx is free. And our Kerbal gets to go into the Lynx spacecraft. So that's desiski boarding the Lynx spacecraft and into a command chair. We have the Lynx spacecraft dock. And everybody else still has to go out and get into command chairs. So here's Durlaf taking his chair. And Copper Spikes taking a chair as well. So we have removed our crew from the hide and now they can head back down to the surface. So there's the deorbit burn. And approach to Earth. Very scenic. Nothing beats Earth for the scenery. And service module separation. Re-entry heat. Of course, the Lynx is a very well-tested system as far as re-entry is concerned, so no problems there. And of course, splashdown. So yes, a very safe system for our purposes, except for the whole engine attached to the second stage thing. This is mirror around the moon, not your regular mirror, and we have only one occupant, Barafil. I'm not too sure what he's doing there, but he insisted on being alone on mirror. So we have to resupply him, and we are taking a nice heavy load of supplies so we don't have to pay attention to him for a very long time. It's possible that he's being imprisoned, I don't know. <laughs> um, uh, Mir, Mir isn't the most comfortable place to stay for a very long period of time, even though of course people stay there longer than on any other space station, I believe the record is on Mir. But, yep, yeah. off goes the first stage, thankfully with those Separatrons, though it won't be the last time that I forget Separatrons. The, first launch of the Kasei rocket in this video. That will happen because of subassembly. I still haven't updated the subassembly to have the Separatrons on, <laughs> even now. So the default will continue. But anyway, we are in orbit around the Earth. We transfer over to the moon with the same stage. And off goes the supply vessel. A heavily modified HTV, if you will. Fair amount of supplies, not not small. Because Mir is in a polar orbit and we didn't really get into the same kind of orbit uh, initially, we had to do a correction burn high over the moon. It was the most efficient thing to do to match orbits with Mir. And here we are approaching. And uh, that would be the location where the space shuttle docked as well. Okay, so as our supply vessel to Mir docks, I will say thank you for watching. I hope you enjoyed this video. If you did, please do press like. If you have any comments or suggestions, please leave them in the comment section below, and I will see you next time.